uh, when we talk about herd immunity, we talk about the use of a vaccine and how many people need to be vaccinated uh, to be able to reach the, the right proportion so the virus will not have an opportunity to circulate between people. What we are learning about <coughs> immunity, what we are learning about antibodies, and uh, it comes from seroepidemiology studies. Uh, there are a large number of seroepidemiology studies specifically for SARS-CoV-2 that are occurring right now globally, more than 100 right now. Um, we are working with um, at least 50 countries right now to carry out uh, studies on seroepidemiology so that we use a standardized approach across these different countries. Um, most of the studies uh, that have been conducted so far, um, they've used a variety of methods, they've used a variety of antibody tests, so there are limitations in terms of, I don't want to overgeneralize, um, but what we've learned from the studies available to date is that less than 10% of, of the population has evidence of antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 virus. So what we really want to know are if people have these neutralizing antibodies, which are co uh, collected using a specific type of test, antibody test. Not all studies are actually looking for neutralizing antibodies. There are some higher seroprevalence rates among some, some frontline workers, some higher risk groups. So, for example, healthcare workers or some frontline workers you know, who have been directly exposed to the virus, um, some areas with intense transmission, and those seropositivity rates go around 20 percent, 25 percent. But again, that means that a large proportion of the population remains susceptible. Um, there are some suggestions of what that level of herd immunity needs to reach. Um, a lot of these are done through modeling projections. That is quite helpful. But what we are looking at right now are the results of the seroepidemiology studies that are being conducted, and these tell us consistently across all regions that a large proportion of the population remains susceptible to infection, and that means the virus has an opportunity to spread. So this is why we emphasize so much that we have a, a responsibility ourselves to prevent ourselves from getting infected, and if we are infected, to prevent that virus from passing to others, which is why we focus on the case finding, the contact tracing, isolation of cases, quarantine of contacts. Um, having said that, just lastly to say is when somebody is infected with this virus, we expect that they develop an immune response. What we are learning right now is how strong that response is and for how long that response will last. We do not have a complete picture of this yet, but we do expect that if people are infected, um, and there may be some differences if they have a mild disease or even if they're asymptomatic um, versus if they have a severe disease, they do mount an immune response. What we don't know is for how, how strong that is and for how long that will last, but those studies are currently underway. I've got two inter interventions, Dr. Mike Ryan remotely and then Dr. Bruce Aylward. So, Dr. Mike Ryan, please go ahead. Hi, Margaret, can you hear me? Very well, we can see you too. Great, great. Um, no, just to follow up on Maria, I think the, uh, the issue here is that uh, transmission uh, and susceptibility are, are, are very different in very different countries, different people transmitting, different people susceptible. The fact is that uh, we don't know where this uh, much mooted herd immunity lies, the level of immunity in the population that, that itself by itself suppresses transmission because there aren't enough people susceptible available. Um, the, the question is, we are, there is no question in my mind, we're a long way from that. Uh, and will remain a long way from that in the absence of, uh, of an effective uh, vaccine. It may be lower than was previously suggested at 60, 70, 80 percent. We don't know how much lower. We don't know what role herd, um, um, cell based immunity and other things play in the, in the disease. And we certainly don't know how long uh, protection lasts. So, yes, there's a lot up in the air. There's a lot to be discussed. There's a lot to be. Um, worked out between the scientists. But I think what we can say with certainty is right now, as a planet, as a global population, we are nowhere close to the levels of immunity required to stop this disease transmitting. And we need to focus on what we can actually do now to suppress transmission and not live in hope of herd immunity being our salvation. Right now, that is not a solution. Uh, and it's not a solution we should be looking to uh, for, for our salvation. 
Thank you, Dr. Ryan. And now Dr. Elwes has some more to add. Yes, sorry, Margaret. I think, I think Michael really captured it because there were two parts of this question as we were alluding to, you know, what level of herd immunity. We're dealing with a respiratory-borne pathogen which is relentlessly seeking out the susceptibles. That's what we're seeing, which means you want very high herd immunity. Now, we're also human, so when we hear a range of 50% to 80%, we think, gosh, I hope it's 50%. But in a situation like this, where we lock down half the world's population, where the economy's ground to a halt in so many places, you have to plan for um, a very high levels of herd immunity because we don't want to take chances, we don't want to be wrong. So as we're planning vaccination, as we're planning the rollout, you want to plan to get high coverage and not get lulled into a you know, dangerously seductive uh, suggestion that it could be low. The other part of that question was about um, the if we get 50% uh, vaccination coverage, are we there? And no, this is another point we need to be very clear on. We can't confuse vaccination coverage with the proportion of the population that that's immune because the vaccine may work in 80% of people, 50, 60% of people. So you have to multiply your coverage times the efficacy to figure out what proportion is going to be, uh, be, be actually protected. So if we only get 50% coverage, the number that are actually protected will be even lower, which means we're nowhere near what it would take to protect populations in general. And the last point I would make was the one we discussed last week was, and Mike keeps hammering it, you need the full package. There aren't silver bullets. You're dealing with a nefarious enemy here. You want to have your diagnostics, your testing, your, your quarantining. Um, you want to have your therapeutics as well as your vaccine. And that's why the Director General Launchnin is talking about the ACT Accelerator so much. It's about getting all of these tools to scale so that we can actually tackle this thing properly and get back to the new normal we need to keep our societies functioning and our economies open and our health system safe. Thank you very much for all those answers, Drs. Van Kerkhove, Dr. Ryan, and Dr. Elwood. We now have, we're now moving to Azerbaijan for our next question, which is coming from Kamran Kasimov. Of